present. Hello everyone. So today we'll be talking about puperoparexia, differential diagnosis, history, and examination. Here are my references. So let's learn the terms first. Puperium means the period of time from the time of giving birth to six weeks postnatal. So puperoparexia is fever during this six week postnatal period. And let's look at this case. It is a case of a 36 year old woman presenting with eight days of post normal vaginal delivery emitted for fever of 38.5 degrees Celsius. So fever this high, you have to look at the patient and see whether they look very unwell, check their vitals, you're suspecting sepsis. And you need to take fast actions. So before we take a history, we need to know, uh, we have some, we need to have some differentials in our head to ask some relevant questions. So you can pause this video and try and think of 10 differential diagnoses for puperal pyrexia or puperal sepsis. Once you're done, you can continue this video. So some differentials that you should have. So where did the baby come from? The baby was in the uterus. So when the baby came out and then after that, the placenta had to, came out, had, had to come out, were there any parts of the placenta that was left behind in the uterus? This can cause endometritis. So your endometritis is one of your differentials. Where did the baby come out from? Did the baby come out from a C-section? Was, was a C-section done? Any surgical scars is a potential infection site. Did the baby come out through normal vaginal delivery? Uh, during the delivery, was there any perineal tear or any episiotomy that was done? Any wounds can be prone to infection. And after the baby comes out, the mother has to breastfeed the baby. And this breastfeeding process can cause a mastitis, so infection of the breast tissue. So your differentials here are endometritis, um, C-section, scar infection, perineal infection, and also mastitis. Other than that, you should also think of UTI, urinary tract infections, because these are common in pregnant women and post-pregnancy as well. But that's only five. What else did you think of? Did you think of COVID-19 during this period? Did you think of pneumonia? Pneumonia is very common. Um, the ones in red are the obsangyne related ones, but don't rem don't forget the ones in black. See, pregnant women can get all these too. Dengue, malaria, soft tissue infection from intravenous things, gastroenteritis. So the moral of the story is to think outside the box. Um, Pregnant women are human beings too, so they can also get the other infections that normal human beings get. Don't just limit your differentials to obsangyne related differentials. However, there are so many differentials here. So uh, we need to narrow down to a few initial differentials so that they, they we can start our investigations, our history and all that. So what's the most likely? The most likely is endometritis. So let's look at some risk factors for puperal sepsis. This is uh, from the Grimtop guidelines of RCOG. Obesity is a risk factor. Impact glucose tolerance or diabetes is a risk factor. Um, this, uh, when you have high sugar, sugar is the food for bacteria, so it promotes bacterial growth, promotes infection. Impaired immunity, basically your immune system fights the bacteria, so if your immune system is down, prone to infection. Anemia, I'm not sure why. Vaginal discharge, 
Um, this can be explained by the next slide, which this is taken from up to date. So according to up to date, bacterial um, post postnatal woman with bacterial vaginosis and had underwent C-section has a higher risk of postpartum endometritis. So in bacterial vaginosis, you have a typical fishy order of the a vaginal discharge so you can ask about that in your history and then other than that you have uh, another risk factor is the history of pelvic infection um, so if you had previous infection there's a high chance you have an infection of the pelvis again amniocentesis and other invasive invasive procedures so usually a screening for down syndrome is done using a combined test uh, however if you screen and then it's a high risk you want to confirm uh, the diagnosis you have to do an amniocentesis which is an invasive procedure where they insert a needle to um, withdraw some amniotic fluid to for testing so this process can increase the risk of puperal sepsis as well cervical saclage increases the risk of puperal sepsis uh, or pyrexia um, if you think about it cervical saclage is you have to look for the cervix and then you have to suture up the cervix so the suture is a foreign body and it's prone for infection as well prolonged spontaneous rupture of membranes so anybody any woman presenting with PROM or PPROM any rupture of membranes pre-labor so normally women would uh, like there are two two sometimes women have contractions and then they have um, then only they have their show uh, then only they have their rupture of membranes however sometimes it's also normal for the opposite to happen so they can have rupture of their membranes first and then uh, what their water breaks first then only they have their contractions so usually after the rupture of membrane uh, there's a known as a pre-labor rupture of membrane uh, you will wait for 24 hours to see if the labor contractions start. However, if labor doesn't start in 24 hours, induction of labor is recommended. This is because there's an increased risk of infection after the rupture of membranes. So, um, this is because the uh, membrane is the barrier separating the amnion and the baby, the, basically the contents of the uterus, from the uh, vaginal uh, and cervical flora of bacteria so once the membrane ruptures there's a passage there so uh, there's an uh, increased risk of infection as well um, other than that vaginal trauma cesarean section and wound hematoma and basically any wounds any uh, skin Breakage of the skin increases the risk of infection. Uh, any retained products of conception, like I said earlier, um, any part of the placenta left behind, left to uh, rot in the uh, uterus could uh, lead to an endometritis. Uh, group A streptococcus infection in close contacts of family members. This is because group A streptococcus is the most common pathogen for puperal sepsis. So if any of their family members have a group A strep infection, it might have, they might have passed it on to the patient, the pregnant woman who is presenting with puperal pyrexia. And then uh, ethnicity. And here's some uh, risk factors for postpartum endometritis from up to date. I'm not going to go through them. You can look at them at your own time. Now we go into, now we thought of differentials and then we can know some relevant questions to ask in history and some relevant examinations to do. So one of our differentials was endometritis. So in endometritis, in history, you can ask, if there any abdominal pain, especially in the suprapubic region where the uterus is, 
Um, usually, a uh, postpartum period, you have a normal discharge known as lochia. It should be red for three to four days, around brown for up to four weeks. After that, it should be some white color. However, it shouldn't be mild odorous or purulent. So if it's mild odorous or purulent, you can suspect endometritis. Other than these localized symptoms, you can ask, uh, you can ask about the um, constitutional symptoms, fever, tachycardia, headache, chills, malaise, anorexia, no appetite. So um, examination-wise, uh, when you palpate the abdomen, you can uh, you might be able to elicit uterine tenderness um, because of the endometritis. Um, you may have sub-involution, so a normal uterus should involute to the point that you can't palpate it anymore uh, in about 10 days. So normal involution, uterus should be unpalpable by 10 days. However, if there's any retained product of conception, such as part of the placenta, you might have sub-involution. Also, the consistency of the uterus, um, normally it should be uh, firm in consistency. However, if you have endometritis, it might be soft in consistency instead. Soft, boggy uterus. Now, our other differential was mastitis, so what to do in history examination? Ask them if they are breastfeeding. If they are breastfeeding, is there any breast tenderness? Um, and in examination, you can inspect. You can see the erythema and swelling and maybe discharge. In your urinary tract infections, you can ask urinary symptoms. I have a fun mnemonic for your urinary symptoms. It's fun DH frequency, urgency, nocturia, dysuria, hematuria. Whereas in physical examination, if uh, so, UTI includes pyelonephritis as well. So if you have pyelonephritis, you can have some flank tenderness. And then our differentials also included perineal infection and C-section scar infection. So question you can ask is what was the mode of delivery? If it was C-section, ask if there's any tenderness, uh, any pain on the site, on the C-section scar, any discharge from there, any purulent discharge. Uh, if true normal vaginal delivery, uh, were there any complications such as any tears, any episiotomy that was done? Um, so uh, if these two things are there, so is there any tenderness in the tear or episiotomy areas? Is there any discharge from these wounds? Also, um, they could have had instrumental delivery uh, where one of the instruments involved is a forceps. Uh, forceps can increase the risk of some high vaginal tear or cervical tear. So and this could increase the risk as well. So ask about instrumental delivery. So in physical examination, if it's a C-section scar, you can see the scar. You can inspect the scar. You might be able to see some gaping. You might be able to see some redness and some exudates from the scar. Um, if it's the perineum, you can do an inspection of the perineum. Um, look at the episiotomy scar, uh, look at the yeah, at the episiotomy scar or the perineal tear and see if it's red or swelling or any discharge from there. And um, if it's high vaginal tear, then you might have to do a visit vagina examination to find out. What about the rest of the differentials? So we cover endometritis, mastitis, UTI, perineal infection, C-section scar. What about the rest? So in the history, you need to ask your systemic review. So we all know how to do systemic review, but briefly go head to toe. There's headache, fever, malaise, loss of appetite, cough, runny nose, sore throat, shortness of breath, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, changes in bowel or bladder habit, cough, pain, body ache, and rash. So ask about all this.
So now let's look at the history taking template. I will uh, consolidate the this, the histories we asked for each differential as well as some risk factors that were listed in the green top guidelines. So here's the template. First, you have to identify the patient. You have 10 identification points uh, plus two which are BMI and blood group. BMI is one of the risk factors. As we know, uh, we saw earlier, uh, obesity is one of the risk factors for puparate sepsis. So you need to ask about that. So the format, after identification, you go to presenting complaint and history of presenting complaint, which is the bulk of your history. So first, why is she here? She has a fever of 38.5 degrees Celsius, eight days post-normal vaginal delivery. So you ask about the onset, when did this fever start, and did it get better or did it get worse, and you ask the relevant questions. So uh, these are the questions based on our differentials. You have your endometritis questions, so any abdominal pain, especially in the suprapubic region, any vaginal discharge, uh, the normal vaginal discharge is the lochia. However, you need to ask whether it is purulent or is it foul smelling, mastitis, any, uh, are they breastfeeding, is there any breast tenderness, urinary symptoms, ask your fun DH frequency, urgency, notoria, dysuria, hematuria, perineal questions, so ask about the mode of delivery, so if C-section, ask about the C-section scar, if um, if it's normal vaginal delivery, were there instrument used, was there any test, was there episiotomy done, is there pain in that scar there, if any of those are present. Then there's a systemic review that we just went through. After that, we're going to ask risk factors. So these are the risk factors from Green Top Guidelines. I've decided and divided them into antenatal, intrapartum, and postpartum. So uh, you can think of the risk factors in this order so it's easier to recall. Antenatally, uh, did they have any gestational diabetes mellitus? Remember, diabetes increases the risk of infection. Anemia, I'm not sure why, but it's one of the risk factors. So were, were your pre-pregnancy blood checks, were there any anemia? Amniocentesis, remember the... Test the diagnosing Down syndrome is an invasive procedure, increases the risk of puparapyrexia as well. Cervical saclage was one of the risk factors. Vaginal discharge was one of the risk factors. And you need to ask whether it's foul, fishy smelling or not, indicating bacterial vaginosis during the antenatal period. Mm, prolonged rupture of membrane was one of the risk factors. So PROM or PPROM, did your membranes, uh, did your water break before your contractions, how long um, before you deliver after your rupture of membranes. Choreomneonitis, were there any infection um, when you were pregnant? So preterm or postterm. This was one of the reflectors from up to date, but I couldn't reason out why. After antenatal, you can think in terms of intrapartum. So mode of delivery, uh, we know that this patient has had normal vaginal delivery. However, if C-section, there's an increased risk as well. Um, if there's an instrumental delivery using the forceps, there's increased risk as well. Complications, there is uh, prolonged labor is one of the risk factors. So particularly prolonged first and second stage of labor. So you need to know what is the normal duration of labor. So the normal duration for the, the latent phase uh, or the active phase of labor is um, it should be less than 18 hours for Nulliparis and up to 12 hours for multi Paris woman. And then postpartum, 
postpartum was there any retained product of conception? So did everything come out? Did the placenta come out fully? What was done? Uh, these are and how is she now? These are questions you want to ask her uh, for her current hospital admission. So was she given antibiotics? Um, and how is she now? Is she still having fever? She still not having any appetite, not having energy, things like that. Then after that, we have a mnemonic here, PM GOTS, FFF, SSS, and sprinkle some ice. So PM GOTS stands for Past Medical, Gynecological, Obstetric, Drug, and Surgical History. The relevant ones are here. So medical history, you need to ask about diabetes. Remember, diabetes is one of the risk factors. HIV is an immunosuppressive state, so ask about that. Gynecological history, ask about previous pelvic infections more previous infections, higher uh, risk of coming infections. Drugs, ask about immunosuppressive drugs such as NSAIDs or steroids. Then FFF stands for family history, family planning and finance. Family history of, um, remember family history of group A streptococcus infection was one of the risk factors so you need to ask any of your family members had sore throat, any skin infections. So indicating uh, group A strep, pharyngitis, impetigo, or cellulitis. Finance is also important as low socioeconomic status is one of the risk factors as well. Moving on to SSS, so S, the first S is for social history, second S, sexual history, third S is cervical smear history. So social history, are there smoking, drinking, IVD is a relevant one because um, uh, higher risk of introducing uh, infection into the blood causing sepsis and also a general immunosuppressive state. And then you know, ask your idea, concerns, and expectations of the patient. Once that's done, you go to physical examination. So let's look at this systemically. First, we look at the general inspection, which uh, we look from afar and inspect the patient and their surroundings. So the patient look at their body habits. Are they obese? Remember, obesity is a risk factor. Do they look weak? Um, you have to think, if they do, you have to think of sepsis. Any rashes, uh, uh, generalized macular, uh, macular rash is uh, one of the signs for um, toxic shock syndrome. Any IV lines, and look at the IV lines. Uh, is there any erythema cellulitis at the IV lines? That, that might be the cause of the, the source of infection as well. Then uh, we, so first we look general, then we go to the wrists, we feel for the pulse, we check vitals, all the other vitals as well. We check uh, the, for capillary feel of the fingertips. You, while feeling for the pulse, you check the respiratory rate. Uh, measure the blood pressure and also the temperature. They might have cool peripheries and then a high temperature as well. So vitals are essential So because you don't want to miss out sepsis. It's a life-threatening condition. Next, you move on to the head. So you look at the eyes and the mouth. Look at the conjunctiva for any pallor. Um, and also look for conjunctival suffusion. This is classic of toxic shock syndrome. So basically, it's conjunctional, conjunctival suffi suffusion is the same as conjunctival, um, um, what's that, hyperemia. So that's the redness of the conjunctiva. Also look at the oral mucosa for hydration status, any sunken eyes that indicates uh, dehydration as well. Are important vitals as well. After that, you go to the neck. Um, ideally, you, you would, um, if there's infection, lymph nodes might be swollen. Swelling of the thyroid gland, they might be having thyrotoxicosis that might be have, causing their fever. Um, child, chest and heart, 
so you auscultate the lungs make sure you do auscultate the lungs because pneumonia is a very important differential that we have to think of and you want to make sure the lungs are clear so what else is on the chest, the breast as well. So if there was any um, indication of mastitis, you might want to do a breast inspection or breast examination. Then we move to the abdomen. So first we inspect for any scars. Was there a C-section scar that might be infected? Is there any erythema gaping or exudate from the scar? Palpation. Uh, so you want to check if there's uterine tenderness in the suprapubic region, does the uterus feel soft or firm? Is there any sub-involution? You shouldn't be able to feel it by 10 days postpartum, but if you feel it, probably sub-involution. And then auscultation for bowel sounds. Pelvic examination, the relevant... Uh, so, so if um, they had an episiotomy and the episiotomy scar is painful, so you want to do a perineal inspection and see for erythema or swelling or any discharge from the episiotomy scar or a tear. Um, if it's inside, you might need to do a speculum examination. Uh, or a speculum examination, you can also um, determine if there's any foul smelling vaginal discharge as well. And vaginal examination if it's um, high vaginal tear or something on the inside. And then we move on to the legs. You're gonna check for edema, it's a routine one, and then calf tenderness. Uh, DVT can also cause fever. So that's important. And I think that's all I have for you. I hope it helps. And thank you for watching the video.